Hello, hello. <clears throat> we'll give everybody a couple more minutes. Here's the icebreaker for this week. How late did you stay up on New Year's Eve? I have kids, so I stayed up till nine o'clock. And I think we, I was on the East Coast. I think we welcomed in the new year with London. We did London's new year. Anybody else have any stories from New Year's? I just stay, I, we, I think we made it till one, but we're, me and my fiance, we're, we're pretty late. We go to bed pretty late. So, but nothing, nothing too, nothing too crazy. Just one o'clock central time. <laughs> just one o'clock. Yeah. So I think we saw them celebrate from Louisiana. <laughs> there we go. So what is, what is surprising is I have teenager. So I have my 17 and 16 teenager daughter with me. And in another life, they will have never been with me on New uh, Year um, <laughs> Eve. So it's surprising that you have such, your teenager with you all the time now. <laughs> That's right. I have a, I only have, my oldest is 13. So I have, I barely have a teenager. So. Anybody else? Monso, how late did you stay up on New Year's Eve? I slept at 6 a.m. Hey, wow. I had a bite in the air. <laughs> Chun Li, Bruno, welcome. Hello. Either of you have stories from New Year's? Did you I stay wanted, up late? I wanted to say I, I sl sl slept at a 6 a.m. <laughs> a 6 p.m. <laughs> yeah. Too for that now. There you go. Bruno, how are oh, you? Man? My max was 2 a.m. <laughs> 2 a.m. Hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Nice. Well, I think this is the, the normal crew that we typically see. I imagine a couple people might still join. Um, from what you recall, too, Colin, right? You were saying some other people may be joining. Yeah, some other people reached out, but we'll, we'll see. All right, we'll have to ask them afterwards how late they stayed up in New Year's Eve. Um, all right, anyway, <clears throat> well, thanks everybody for joining this week and uh, hope, everybody, hope, hope it's all going well. The, the study, the practices, the, you're, you're getting some use out of the community and maybe even finding some applications for the things that, that we're going over. Um, it is nice to see everybody again. So, <clears throat> so these are the things that we'll cover here. I'm going to keep putting up the house, the housekeeping reminders. We'll just take a couple seconds to go over that for anybody that's new or, or needs to be reminded about it. Uh, last week, we had a question come up about, about object oriented programming. So we've got um, a little bit more information on that. I've got one resource to share and Colin has one as well. And if anybody else knows more about it, please jump in. Um, and then uh, uh, also last week, Colin had prepared a number of slides. We didn't have time to get to everything. So we'll let him have the bulk of, of what we're going over and he can finish out or get as close as possible to finishing out. If we need to spill over into next week, that's fine too. Um, and then we'll move off of chapter five onto chapter six and keyboard shortcuts. This will just take a second. And then I wanted to do a recap of chapters one through six up to where we are now turn some time over to anybody that has any questions about anything and we'll see if we can either answer them or get them into the Slack. And then some slides we've already seen, getting help and then, and then next week what we'll cover. So with that, um, with that off we go. Oh, the only thing I was gonna say is that um, any, anything that comes after say this part down here, we can also move on into next week. So, um, so Colin, don't feel rushed to get through what you, what you've got, because we can just push any of these things off to next week. All right. So then the, the housekeeping again, um, video camera is optional, but encouraged if we're going too fast, feel free to slow down, uh, slow us down, speak up. That's fine. <clears throat> Make sure that you take time to learn the theory behind these things that we're talking about comes in really handy. And then chapter exercises. And if you get the chance and the ability and you would like to try to teach one of the lessons, please speak up. All right. So object oriented programming. This came up last week when we were talking about some of the things from the book and, and the, the mention in the book said that R is an object oriented programming language. 
And one of the questions that came up was, well, as opposed to what? What, what else is there besides object oriented? <clears throat> so I had come across a resource um, here in the Slack. It was by a user named Scott Nessler, but the resource itself is by somebody named Anthony Shook, who, who I, I don't think is on our Slack. Um, so I'm going to talk about that for just a second. And then Colin was able to find a paper by John Chambers, and he'll take a second to talk about that. Um, also, uh, Colin and I are coming from, uh, from this, this perspective. If you guys are familiar with The Walking Dead, this is a character who, for this is a spoiler, by the way, so uh, close your ears if you haven't watched The Walking Dead yet. But anyway, so this, this character pretends to be a scientist as a way to survive in the zombie apocalypse. And then finally, after a number of seasons, it comes out that he's not actually a scientist. And so here he has to say, I lied, I am not a scientist. I am not a computer scientist either. So I don't know exactly what object-oriented programming is or the comparisons. All I'm trying to do here is just pass along a little more information from actual scientists. And uh, what we should really probably do is have an actual computer scientist come on and explain the difference here about object-oriented programming. Anyway, all right. So that's a lot of, of information as we get into this. This was the resource that I had found. It's available in, uh, if you search in Slack and you just type in object-oriented programming, uh, there's a PDF that shows up. It's like 40 slides long or something. Um, I made it through three of them before the concepts moved you know, over my head, but these did sort of ring a little bit in my mind as I sort of got these concepts. It says object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm focused on objects and their interactions. It's in contrast to procedural programming where you have data that you pass from function to function in order to receive or to achieve a result. So this part, I don't know the diff I don't know how this is different from object-oriented programming, the idea of passing data from a function to a function. Um, but this idea that he that he puts forth about um, object-oriented programming being about objects and their interactions does make sense to me. The idea that you create a, a blueprint of an object, um, for instance, you might make the object of cats, and then those, those objects will all have certain attributes like breed, color, pattern, or fur length, and they'll also have methods. So you can pet a cat, you can feed a, a cat, you can fill your phone with photos of a cat, these are different methods then that go with the object of, of cat. And so <clears throat> in, in the world of R, we have this idea of creating objects and uh, through blueprints and then make them interact with each other and give them attributes. So, um, so that was what I came up with. If you wanted to read more and look at the rest of those slides on that, um, let me know. I can, I can put it in the Slack and you guys can look over that. Um, then the other resource then was this paper and Colin, what did you, did you get a chance to distill this down or any, any new insights from this paper? Uh, and again, I got a preference that I am not a computer scientist by any means. And so pretty much I, I thought your explanation at the beginning was good. Um, I, I think there's there's also a, a, a Twitter thread from a person by the name of Colin Fay. Um, I follow some of his work. Uh, he's, he's a big, he's kind of big in, in the R stats, especially on Twitter. And he has a pretty good blog that does some pretty good descriptions of stuff too. And he did a Twitter thread about object oriented programming and functional programming in R. He cites this paper. I haven't fully read all of it yet. I kind of read the intro, the abstract and the conclusion and kind of scanned through the rest of it. But he basically kind of talks about, um, you know, the differences between functional programming and object-oriented programming and then how they're kind of implemented in R. And I really think, and I'm going to say these things and they're probably going to be completely abstract to you, but one day if you spend enough time in R, you're going to like notice it and you're going to be like, now I understand. Because I, I heard these a long time ago, these statements, and then it didn't click for me. So I started using it for a couple of years and then I was like, these finally make sense. So the two things he brings up are everything that exists is an object and everything that happens is a function call. 
And so what we're doing in this type of object oriented programming language is we're creating objects to which that we can do computations on. And then everything that we do in R is a function call. And some of the stuff won't come up again until we start talking about functions later in the book, but it will click for you when you kind of look through these resources. I do highly suggest looking through the, the Twitter feed because Colin Faye does a pretty good job of like distilling like these concepts down a little bit. And then if you want to go down the rabbit hole, you can read this more academic paper if you would like. Um, I will definitely say when I started reading it, I was like, I'm a little in over my head. So just know that if you decide to go down the John Chambers paper. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, it's funny you mentioned that. I, when I was trying to understand this too, I checked out a YouTube video by um, an actual computer scientist and <clears throat> I was completely confused, but the audience in the talk, everybody, you could hear audibly hear people say, oh, oh, I get it. So anyway, I'm really far away from saying, oh. Um, all right, so, um, and, and I think you had a link on that already in the Slack, right, for the, the blog you're talking about? All right, anybody who knows more want to weigh in on object-oriented programming, the difference? Okay, <clears throat> if not, all right, we'll find another resource that hopefully maybe can join and, and answer some questions about it for us. All right, moving on then, chapter four and five, close out. Over to you, sir. Uh, so yeah, um, so I'll share my screen and I can, we'll pick up where we left off last time. Uh, my internet connection has been kind of wonky today. So if I do cut in and out, just let me know and I'll jump out and see if I can fix it real quick. Um, so yeah, just let me know if I'm having any issues, but can people see my screen? Number two, can everybody see the, okay, cool. So last time we left off talking about, uh, we, we finished off kind of talking about select and I kind of quickly went this one slide here. Uh, talking about this function called rename and how we can actually rename columns in data sets. And so just to kind of reiterate this fact again, is, is that there is this function called rename. Here's kind of the basic syntax for you again. Um, so the book suggests if you are going to rename like a column name in a data set to use rename, but you can also use select as well. But just understand that if you use select, it's only going to re retain that one column. So uh, if you decide to rename using select, you'll also have to include the other column names that you want. So where we were kind of going after that was to talk about the mutate function. And I will tell, you know, I've been, like I said, from my own experience working with R for about four or five years now, I think I use mutate every single day. Um, because it's just one of those things that allows us to create new fun new columns from uh, functions of existing columns. And so it allows us to create basically new columns based off of some operation we want to perform. One thing that I, I do usually is uh, add two columns together, you know, so that's something that mutate can do. Uh, it can also do group sums and group means and group averages and group medians. And we'll talk about that here in a second when we talk about group by. But mutate is a function that you probably want to get really comfortable with because you'll, you'll use a lot. And how this always works is that you always got to remember that mutate always adds new columns at the end of the data set. So anytime you create a new column or use mutate to create a new column, it's always going to be at the end. Uh, I also found this kind of interesting. I didn't know this, but if you only want the calculated columns to be returned, you can use this function called transmute. I wish I would have known this earlier because there's times that sometimes I make a calculation and I have to go all the way to the end of the data, data frame to look at it, but I could have just used transmute to get what I wanted back. Now, uh, when we utilize, we can utilize cre uh, creation functions to calculate new columns. I'll talk more about like some of the functions we can use to actually do that. But one big rule that was talked about in the book was that they must be vectorized. Uh, basically, it just means that it takes a vector as an input and returns a vector with the same number of values as output. Now, I had a question about this. I've heard this a few times. Um, so 
I, I mean, I kind of understand it, but this was a question that I have is what is, what, what does it mean that a function has to be vectorized? What, what are some of the rules that we have to do it? And if, does anybody have any examples of, of how to maybe kind of put this into more simple terms? So maybe that's a question that we'll have to kind of table for another time, but it's something to think about because it, it I, in the book, it was very clear that this is a rule that we need to follow. Um, I think it's mainly that we need to have, I, I think it, one thing my perspective is, is that like, if we have columns of data, the columns of data need to be the same length to perform some function on it. But maybe we can dig into that later some other time and talk about it, um, and find an answer for it. I, I try to think of vectors and I don't, this is just the way I've thought about it so far is <clears throat> this vectors being uh, just like you said, like a column of cells. And so it's one thing to just list out a bunch of numbers that might, that would just be like a string or a, a, a bunch of numbers, one right after the other, <clears throat> but you, you can turn that into a vector through some functions so that it's, it's considered more of like a column or a series of cells. Like each number is in its, is in, in its own cell, even though you're not actually doing that on the screen, when you vectorize a, a list of numbers or a list of words or something, then it, it takes on that form. But that's, that's how I think about it. Maybe, uh, maybe it's right, maybe it's not. Or, or maybe it's a difference we summarize when if we want to have the mean or max, it means that we have a vector, but at the end, we just have one number, but we use summarize. And if we don't use summarize, if we use mutate, after we have the same number on all the colon. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Okay. I, I think I see what you're saying, Sandra. Um, yeah, I think I see what you're saying there because I've had that issue before where I would do a mutate and then I would get like the same calculation across. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, if you could, if you could find an example of that and show it to me, that would be great because I think now I now I think I understand it a little bit better now with that kind of explanation. Does anybody else have any more? Okay, good. That was awesome. Um, so here's some useful creation functions. I'm not going to dig too much into these because I mean this is not an exhaustive list, and many of you might have different functions that you want to use to create your calculations with. Um, some of the ones that I use most commonly are the arithmetic. Uh, I haven't really used modular arithmetic, but I probably should in some cases. Uh, I've used lead and lag before. So for like trend analysis, and then I've used like cumulative sum and then cumulative product. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole range of functions that you can use within mutate to create your calculations. And so um, you can kind of look at that in the book. Uh, so here's an example of using mutate. And so instead of me just kind of blabbering um, and talking about it, let's just kind of talk about what's happening here. So can somebody explain to me, going back to what we discussed last time, what's happening up here? And this isn't the example from the book, but what's happening in this first kind of code chunk? They want to take a stab. Anyone want to be brave? This first one here. Are you creating a new variable? I am down here. I am creating. I am creating something here, though. I am creating something new right here, though. You are creating a new data frame. Just select some columns. Here and to day, this conjunct of the columns, all the columns that ends with delay, right? Distance and air time, just some, so a subset of the flights that are framed, right? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, so basically, we're just cre we're creating a new data frame and we're just taking columns, um, we're selecting columns. And so, you know, like Bruno said, 
we're doing it in different ways. We're selecting all the columns between the columns year and day inclusive. So it's going to take year and day. Anytime that says delay or it ends with the word delay, distance and airtime. So here's the one that we just kind of talked about with mutate. Again, we're creating a new column based on some function of another column. What are we doing here? Or what is the result of this code chunk right here? What is what is happening? What am I creating? So you got you got three new columns added in. So what would be the three new columns? Yeah, gain hours and gain per hour. Yep, definitely. And so what we're doing is we're we're taking this data frame that we have here and we're creating three new columns at the end called gain hours and gain per hour. And we're actually creating these calculations using, you know, subtraction, division, and then division by, you know, a, a numeric value and then division by two columns itself. And so we're just basically adding three new columns to our data set. And that's all this is really doing. And but are we saving them? We are not. And why are we not? Yeah. Why are we not? We're creating, we're creating the object, but how come we're not saving it? Because we, we don't allocate to, uh, to something. It's just uh, an action. It's not an allocation. Yeah. So it's, it's basically like a view is what I think of it. It's a view of the data, but we haven't saved it. We haven't, we haven't assigned it a value. So um, what we would have to do is we'd have to use the assignment operator and we'd have to assign it to some value. So awesome. But I mean, I think of this kind of like a view, like I just want to take a view of what the data is. So say I want to see gain hours, gains per hour, you know, I can see it and it will pop up in my console if I want to see it, but excellent. Awesome. What would be the function that I would use if I only want to return these three columns and not the other columns? Transmute. Transmute, yeah. I thought that was so I, I thought that was so cool. I wish I would have known about transmute a lot earlier than before. So cool, awesome. The other thing that I also wanted to point out with this question here is uh, notice how we can refer to previously created variables in the same mutate function. So we calculate gain in hours previously in this function, in this mutate function here, we can actually refer to them in the same mutate call. So we don't have to do two mutates to get that. Now you couldn't go gain per hour equals gain divided by hours up here, but if you do it here at the end, you can refer to a previously calculated value as well. So, so let's talk about the pipe. Uh, I know the book talks about the pipe a little bit later, but I think you need to talk about the pipe operator a little bit before we talk about group by and summarize. Uh, the pipe allows us to chain commands together. And so I basically and your data object. Hey, hey, Colin, you cut out for a second right there. Got a really good quote. Whoops, sorry about that. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah, you just cut out for about 10 seconds or so. Oh, sorry about that. Like I said, I've been having internet connection issues today. Uh, so Zoom meetings were kind of delayed. Um, so the pipe operator allows us to chain commands together. And I thought the book had a really good way of putting this. It's saying, as suggested by this reading, a good way to pronounce the pipe when reading code is then. So when I'm using like the pipe, I'm saying, take this data object, then filter it, then select, then mutate some other value. So when, when I kind of talk about this with other people, I talk about the pipe, I always make them say like, think of it like a sentence. I'm doing this and then I'm doing this and then I'm doing this and then I'm doing this. And so the pipe is just kind of a way to help us better read and put things together. And so the reason why we want to use the pipe is for several reasons. So take a look at this code right here. I'm just doing three things. I'm filtering out, I'm arranging it, and then I'm selecting the columns that I want. Now, if we use the pipe, 
what we can do is we can actually combine all of these actions into one chunk of code and assign it to or assign some value to that object. So look at the difference between these two. Here, we're doing three different steps, assigning three different values to our objects, but this is a lot to read. Compared to this, where we use a pipe, it's easier to read. And so when you look at this, you can say, okay, take the flights data and then filter out Atlanta. This is a double, this is a double space or a double equal sign. Then arrange it in descending order by arrival delay, and then select these three columns. So there are several benefits to this. The first is, is it makes our code easier to read. Going back to what we discussed last week, think about your future self and think about others reading your code. What, what, which one would you rather want to read? Would you want to read this one? Would you want to read this one? The other thing is, is it helps us keep us from cluttering up our environment with objects. So looking at this, how many different objects am I creating with if I if I look at this for this for this first code chunk here, how many different objects have I basically created? Yeah, three objects, right? Yeah, I have three, yeah, right? Yeah. Down here, yeah. how many do I have? Yeah, just one. If they just me. Or yeah, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, so I only have one right here. And so, you know, for like a small thing like this, it doesn't, it, you know, it makes it pretty easy, but just say we had 50 different computations that we were doing. Then it's going to blow and it's going to blow it up our environment. It's going to make our environment pane just full of different objects. So does anybody remember or does anybody have any other ideas of oops of the benefits that a pipe can provide? Does anybody remember? I don't remember necessarily from the book, but I like the idea of just being able to go back and change change one little thing like maybe you want to change the destination from atlanta to, to chicago you just change it in one place and then rerun and you're not you know uh creating new objects or amending new objects and and morphing object after object you just you just make a change and then you have uh you have the new output yeah that's awesome that's a good one I also, for kind of along that same lines, like if I needed to do something else, I would just do like a copy and paste, take this structure, paste it. And like you said, Ryan, just add Houston, you know, something like that. Anybody else have any other like benefits to using the pipe compared to this top way to write it? One that I had was is that we talked about this last week too is naming things is hard. Think if you had to constantly go through and like name things over and over and over again, it really slows you down. If you have to keep constantly thinking about what am I going to call this thing? Just, you know, do your big computation and give it one name. I caught that in the book in my reread and I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And then the other thing is, is it helps us read it from right to left, which we talked about a little bit here, but um, it helps us read from left to right, and it kind of makes it like a dialogue when you talk about it. Uh, yeah, so great. If anybody has any other benefits, you know, throw them in the Slack, um, and then we'll talk about it a little bit later. So let's talk about the summarize function. Um, summarize is similar to mutate. Um, I might get in trouble by saying that, but uh let's just use the definition of the book it collapses a data frame to a single row and so summarize is great for like if we want to like collapse our data down and create some calculation off of a column and so here's kind of the basic syntax for it summarize we take our data frame we take our new variable name equal to our calculated expression we'll talk more about group by here in a second but say you just wanted to get the average delay across all flights in 2013 well, what you can do is you can go summarize, take your data frame of flights, put in your, your new column delay, use this function called mean. We'll talk more about this na.rm equals true here in a second and get a calculation of 12.6. So let's talk about an example here. So, uh, oh, that's group by, excuse me. So let's talk about group by. So the reason why I wanted to talk about the pipe beforehand 
was because it makes a lot more sense when you get the pipe idea down first and then look at it with group by. Another function that I use quite a bit in the work that I do is I do a lot of group buys and summarize. Um, so when we look at group by, what we're basically doing is in the back end of the data frame, we're creating specific groups to which we want to change our unit of analysis. And so the book kind of talks about that group by changes the unit of analysis from the whole data set to specific subsets. So say I wanted to calculate the average departure delay for the year, month, and day. So I'm interested in what was the average delay on January 3rd of 2013? Well, I could find that answer by using a group by and summarize. And so if you look at this, oops, I keep messing around with that. When I do this, I get this calculation here and this output from the group by summarize. So looking at this, can anybody tell me what was the average departure delay on uh, January 6th, 2013. You may want to take a stab. What was the average delay on January 6th, 2013? Seven point one five. Yep, so seven point one five. So basically what this is doing is it's collapsing all the data, so we take all of our data of all the flights in 2013, it basically collapses them and calculates a mean. So here's a question. Does anybody remember why do we need this na.rm equals true in this mean function? Does anybody remember? What would happen? I guess another way to put it is what would happen if we excluded that? Then it would also take all the NAs and then we wouldn't actually get the result. Yeah, so you just get all NAs in that column because R will treat uh, an NA value as not being there. And so anything that's not there, you can't create a calculation off of it. So this NA.RM basically is saying, take out any NAs that are there before you actually do the calculation. And so that's what this NA.RM talks about. It has a whole section on that. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it but certain functions will have this NA to RM for you to actually get rid of NA values. So here's some useful summary functions. Again, I'm not gonna spend too much time digging into these because you know some of them, um, uh, some may find them useful, some may find them otherwise uh, not useful. So such things as measures of location, you have mean median, measures of spread, so like your standard de deviation, your interquartile range, um, measures of rank, your min, max, uh, measures of position first, nth, last, your counts. Uh, I do use n quite a bit. I've also used n distinct quite a bit, and then I've also used count. I haven't really done any of these counts and proportions of logical values. I really haven't used that before, but it's it's available to you. A question is calling. Yeah. Um. So, is there a, is there a order we need to follow between these uh, uh, functions versus group by? Can I put a group by after summarize or? That's a good question. Uh, hmm. That is a good question. I'm not sure. Does anybody want to weigh in on that? Yeah, no, I don't think you can because the it's going to summarize based off of how you group by. So like the one that you have on the screen, if you wanted to do the average delay by month rather than by day, then you would need to group by year, comma, month, and then summarize, or year, comma, year, comma, month, comma, day, and then summarize on that. I, I think it has to stick to that order. Um, okay. I'm gonna bring up a counter to that, but this may be like a way left field idea. Uh, if you maybe if you were doing some type of join, so like if you were doing a join somehow you may be able to do like a summarized group by join kind of that ordering, but I don't, I maybe only done that a couple times, but that's like way like left field of what I'm discussing, like what we're that's talking about now, but it's possible. But I think Ryan's just like, if you're just doing like a general calculation, you have to keep mm -hmm. summarized first. But if you're adding in data with like a join, you might run into that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, no problem.
Uh, so useful. Um, so you can also group by multiple variables. So I, I thought this was kind of neat to talk about how if you kept doing like a summarize, it would like kind of peel off your summaries. So we can start off by looking at like what's the uh, um, like how many flights happen per day. And so we can start with this with the grouping by by flights year month and day and then do a summarize and we get our number of daily flights. But then if we summarize this new data frame here and do a sum of flights again, we would get the per month. And then if we did it again on this new object called per month, did a sum of flights, we would get flights per year. And so I thought that was neat. Uh, the book did, did mention that this works with sums and counts, but be very careful with rank based statistics. So like mean and median, um, you can't, it's kind of, it's, I'm kind of going back on my statistics class that I took several years ago. Uh, you can't, it's kind of hard, it's not very good to take a mean of a mean. And so you want to take into consideration that when you peel this off, think about the types of calculations that you're doing because it works with sums and counts, but be careful with like means, medians, and, and calculations like that. If we have statisticians in here who want to explain that more to me, you know, please step in. <laughs> Um, so another thing that they talk about, the book talks about is ungrouping. Uh, I've used ungrouping quite a bit. I've seen this other thing that's been popping up lately since like with the update with, um, with dplyr is, and I'll have to share it up, I'll have to step back here for a second, but the summarize regrouping output by year override with groups argument. So I'm not sure if ungroup is important as much as it used to be because it might be built in, but if you ever need to ungroup, something you have this function called on this function called on group which basically just removes the grouping for the data set and so when you look at the data looking at this like data set right here if you have this output what's really nice about dplyr output is it actually shows you the grouping in the actual output itself so if you're wondering is there grouping on this data set applied you can see up here that in the output, if there are groups applied to that specific object that you've created, it's in the And so if you remove this kind of characteristic data from if you need to. Did I cut out? Just for a second, but I, I think you're back now. Yeah, you, you cut out for a second, but I okay. think you're back. Okay, cool. So on groups there, it's available if you want it. Uh, so this is one of the last things I'll talk about. Uh, I'm just going to basically say the book says avoid this. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But uh, groups. So you can kind of do this to kind of get some quick, quick view. I've never really used this, but it's available to you. But the book also says don't use it, you know, or it's not very suggested to use it. It suggests using window functions, which I kind of dug into, but I still have no under, don't have a full understanding of that yet. But if you want it, it's available. You can use it. There's functionality in that to actually do it as well. So we did some of the questions discussions last time. Um, so that's pretty much all I had to kind of finish up. I know this was a big broad strokes overview of the chapter and there's some more specific nuances and I'm more than happy to kind of help answer any questions about those specifics. I tried to understand ungroup and I couldn't really think of a situation where you would group and then ungroup, but you said that you use ungroup quite a bit because I was thinking that the idea is you start out with some very, very specific or very granular data and then you want to aggregate up and so you use group and then maybe you want to group again. And so I get this idea of, of higher levels of grouping but I don't know when you would ever like group up and then ungroup. It, it seems like you would be undoing all of the all of the grouping that you just accomplished. So when do you when do you want to use ungroup? Yeah, uh, I, I had that same question because when I have to do it, I come across it. I'm like, oh, I have to do it here. Um, the way I kind of think of it is it's, I don't have a specific example off top 
my mind because I've come across it in the wild and I'm like, okay, I need to right now. Um, we could take that unless somebody wants to answer that because I wanted to find an example of it. But um, let me kind of think on that one. Yeah, I'm good if we if we look Unless at it. Next. Wants to answer on it. I'm good if we. Because I knew there was some in some of the work. I mean, I can think that if 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 we are grouping by some specific variable, and then later we realize that we do not want to do any calculations uh, based on that, but we wanted to group using some other variable, like instead of months, we wanted to group using dates. Then you go back and ungroup and then do that again. That's what I thought it was for. But when you would, if you group by months, then you would generate some kind of output. If it's a, a view, like you would group by months and then you would have some kind of analysis done at the month level. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I don't know, do you just put another pipe at the end and like you do group by months, pipe, output, another pipe, ungroup, and then group again by the day? Is it so that you can like generate multiple outputs with the same, same like sentence of code? Uh, or maybe if you want to compute manually the, the difference uh, of the mean. So you are first to group to compute the mean, then after you have to ingroup, then after you compute the difference. Because the mean will be will be um, specific by uh, by day or by month, so I believe that is the reason why sometimes you group and ungroup, or maybe just to have something neater, cleaner, in case you are doing other computation and you want to be sure that. Uh, my understanding is more that at least you know if you ungroup, at least you know that it's in group and you know that everything will be done on the wall set. More more likely something just to to be sure of what you are doing. So it suggests avoid to create multiple variables or objects in the in the um, in the program, right? It's like a capture intermediate results, and then you don't like it, you ungroup it. That might be so. You, so you do a few steps, and then you assign it out, and then do a few more steps, and assign maybe. I, I kind of skipped that section, so, <laughs> so now I'm asking. I think it has something to do with like when you when you apply a group by to an object, you're applying new characteristics to that data object. And so if you carry that data object throughout the rest of your code, you're carrying on those characteristics of your group by. And so you use on group if you're creating like a data set that you want to like do further computations down on. So I think that was what Sandra was, was saying as well, is like further on you want to do computations on that object. So it's just good to kind of remove that group. That's the way I kind of understand. That's the issues that I run into is, is like I'm carrying on like this object that I want to use and it has that group by, it has those groups still applied to that data object. Any other questions? Colin, did you have any other any other steps on uh, any other slides you're going to cover? That was everything that I had. I do want to say one thing about the pipe, uh, a tip uh, that's really kind of nice to have, and this is kind of maybe a good segue into our like tips that we're going to have for next. Uh, Control Shift M puts a pipe in for you, so you don't always have to do uh, percent caret percent, you can just go control shift M and it autom it automatically populates it for you. So good tip for you. Cool. All right, um, I will take back over the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, thanks for covering that, those two chapters. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so chapter six, just it, it talks a little bit about workflow. It's a really short chapter and I just wanted to call out a couple of things from it. So one of the things that it mentions is that, uh, is this, you can see I have this comment here where it says cursor online two, 
then control plus enter will run line two. So it's a bit of a keyboard shortcut that if you want to run a single line, you can have your cursor on that line and then hit control or command enter and it will run that line. Also, if you wanted to run a couple of lines at the same time, you can just highlight those and then hit control enter and it will run everything that you've highlighted. Okay. So I found myself going through and making an adjustment and going back and highlighting again and making and then running it and then changing it, highlighting it, running it as I'm as I'm trying to work through some some outputs. Okay. So just a bit of a, of a keyboard shortcut there. <clears throat> um, if you ever want to modify the keyboard shortcuts, you can go up to tools, modify keyboard shortcuts, and then it'll give you a big window like this and you can scroll down and find the shortcut or the, the function that you want to do. This is one that I did um, because I also use uh, SQL Server Management Studio and to run code in SSMS, you use F5. And so I just thought, let me just make all of it, everything that I use, I'll just make it all to run using F5. And so I came into R and I changed that. So, so I actually don't use control enter. I just use F5 because it matches what I was already used to. Okay. So if you wanted to change any of the keyboard shortcuts, you can do that um, that way. And then um, a couple of the shortcuts that we've talked about um, are the assignment operator and the pipe operator. And so the assignment operator we know is that kind of left pointing arrow and the, alt, and the shortcut for that is alt and then the, the dash. Okay, so I've got that listed out here. And then I, <clears throat> I the, the, the assignment operator is pretty commonly used obviously. And I think the pipe operator is pretty commonly used as well. So I actually went in and changed the keyboard shortcut for the pipe operator and made it alt period. Um, which is the, it's also the, the right pointing arrow, the greater than sign. So I overrode this R shortcut, control shift M or alt period. That way that I, e either of these shortcuts or either of these operators that are commonly used, it's just alt and one other key. And I know if I'm doing the assignment operator, it's a dash. If I do the pipe operator, it's a period. So um, take that for what it's worth if you want to um, change that or use the, the defaults or look through all the different keyboard shortcuts that are available. Those are there. And that's chapter six. Cool. All right. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to recap really quickly what we've done up to this point. We've covered a lot of ground and hopefully you've had the chance to do a lot of the exercises and read through what, what the book has presented for us. So we started out looking at the RStudio IDE and talking through what we see when, when we launch RStudio. And we talked about uh, cheat sheets, including this one for RStudio itself. And um, from there, we went and talked about packages. And we talked about how packages enhance or extend uh, what R can do. We have basic packages in a, that are in base R, and then we have everything else that you might want to do afterwards, similar to the way that, that apps extend the abilities of our smartphones. We talked about uh, needing to install as a one-time action, install the package first, but then every time that you launch R Studio or need to use it in a new session, you have to, uh, have to load the package again. Um, and then we also started plotting. We talked about ggplot and how ggplot is, will, uh, will start the plots and you, you include the data set first. And then all that does is just load. It tells R what data you want to plot out, but then you have to add in the geomes afterwards. And the geomes will tell um, R what kind of plot to make. So in this example, we have a ggplot with the data being the MPG data source. And then we have geome underscore point, which makes this scatter plot. Or you can do, there's a whole bunch of other ones. There's bar or geome underscore, underscore bar, geome underscore smooth, underscore line, and so on and so forth, right? And then, um, and then within, once you've done that, you, you need to include an aesthetic, AES for aesthetic to assign um, how different features of the graph will populate um, and some of the aesthetics 
for G on the point are listed down here, alpha, color, fill, and so on. We talked about including the including the, uh, the aesthetic within the parentheses if you want that aesthetic to be mapped to data or including it outside of the parentheses, the AES parentheses, if you just want to tell R how it needs to be. And then we went through a number of exercises and I believe these are in chapter three. And so if you haven't had a chance to go through these exercises in chapter three, I would, I would highly recommend doing it. It'll, it really boosts your knowledge and experience going through these exercises, not just the exercises, but then also playing around and experimenting with what, uh, with, with what you've got in front of you. Okay. Then we talked about, this is what Colin has covered. So he, he talked about these different transformation um, functions and um, creating objects with the assignment operator. Uh, there was the slide about the naming rules and you can look up tidyverse style, tidyverse style guide and some different style guides, which are really helpful. We talked about the pipe operator tonight and chaining commands together. So cool. So that covers the, the recap. Yeah, I think everybody should be pretty proud of themselves for, for getting through the first six chapters. There's a lot of information in there and you built a lot of skills. So it's a nice job. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time allowing anybody to ask any questions that they might have. Does anybody have anything? We have about seven minutes, maybe five minutes. Um, but if anybody has any questions that they've run across, I'll, I'll let you go through it. If not, we can, we've got, uh, we can just kind of wrap up. So anybody have any experiences so far that you want to ask questions about? Um, I had a question about office hours. Okay. So how do we exactly, um, I mean, I have the link and I'm able to see who has which hours. Yeah. So do we reach out to people on Twitter? No, let me, let me show you. I actually, um, oh, I pause this. I'm going to pause the share real quick. <clears throat> yeah, office hours. My first experience with uh, with office hours was yesterday, and it actually went really, really well. So I'm just going to I'm going to pull up my browser here, but I'm going to close some of these um, so some of these tabs that I had open. So it is uh, r4ds.io slash calendar. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so if you go to uh, r4ds dot count, uh, what was it? r4ds dot io slash calendar. That's the that's the link, right? So then you go and you find today, whatever day it is, and you can click on the time period, whichever time you're available for, or whichever office hours you'd like to use. So um, somebody has office hours at 5 p.m. at central time today, right? So then you click on that. You can click on more details. Um, and it didn't have a link on that one. So let me show you the one that I did yesterday. So um, you can click on, sometimes it'll have, have this link, like a little Google link there. And you can click on this. <coughs> And it lets you join in to the Google Meetup. Um, I haven't, I haven't had a situation where it didn't have that link, though. So maybe, th so this would be office hours with Tony. The one yesterday that I did was uh, office hours with Matt Wood. So you can just click on whichever one, and then more details and hopefully it has this Google meetup link. Here's with uh, Scott, click on that. Anybody else use the office hours? I think they also too, I think if nobody's in the meeting, they'll also go out and answer questions in the Slack too. So if you, if you have a question that you want to answer, ask, they'll kind of go through and look for questions that have been unanswered. So if you don't want to do the meetup, you could just put drop an answer in, in the channels and then people will try and answer them. 
Yeah. You can also tag people in the Slack as well. If you want to add a person, um, add a teammate, and you can just type, you know, <clears throat> whatever it is, and reach out to them directly. Okay. Anybody else? Any other questions you come across? No, I, I just have a remark because I'm coming from Airbase, and I found it difficult. I found the book difficult for someone with, who has no experience previously. For I am fine because I'm coming from Airbase, but without, but I found that it's a bit uh, tough to begin with just this book. So I don't know what could be the experience of other people, but uh, without, but I find it difficult without previous experience. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Yeah, and, uh, what I can say about this is uh, the <laughs> the amount of content that we said we to teach the course in some of that, and uh, we've covered about mm, about half of the course in weeks. So you know, don't this don't get because this is a lot of material in the, in the past couple chapters. Yeah, no, I know that it's because I'm coming from Airbase and SQL, so I'm fine. But I was thinking that somebody without this kind of previous experience could find it a bit tough. Oh, so sure. I just want to stress out that it could be tough if you have no other background. Sure. Uh, I understand. Now, now I see what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I think I mentioned on the very first session that I had I had picked up R, gave up on it, picked up Python, gave up on that one, picked R back up, gave up on it again. I've gone back and forth quite a few times, so uh, eventually, hopefully, it sticks. But um, maybe maybe that's the objective of the book because one of the questions that I have more more difficult in five it's about the convert a number in days. Mm -hmm. in, in minutes right based on midnight so i have a lot of trouble on that yeah. they teach us also think analytics right so. yeah um well yeah maybe we can look at that one in depth next week um and talk through that example that would be good our time's up so um i will um just close out with with this, uh, just to, so you can take a look at getting help, these resources are always there. And then for next week, we'll do chapter seven, exploratory data analysis. So in the meantime, if you could um, look up library or the, look up the diamonds and MPG data, just take a look over that. Um, and those are the ways that you can get to those things. All right, um, that's all I had. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks, Colin, for jumping in. Um, and uh, we'll pick it up again next week. Thank you. All Thank right. you. See you guys. Bye. Bye-bye.